King James Bible. Fall is October and specifically. Just saying. But let's start out in John chapter 6 this morning. Growing up as a Roman Catholic, it's a strange thing how that religion, that belief system, doesn't take any of the Bible literally except for this passage. To eat the literal blood and literal flesh of Jesus Christ. That's why they hold up the wafer and do what's called transubstantiation. They believe through the hocus pocus, and that's one of the Latin terms they use in abracadabra. If you don't think that, go do a little research when they're mumbling over that stuff. and all. They believe they're actually transforming that wafer and that wine of the body and blood of Christ. Now just very quickly, I'm not ragging on the Roman Catholics. Baptists have a lot of garbage religion too, believe me. And of all the religions I hate in the world, I hate the Baptist religion the most. Well, you got Baptists on your door. Yeah, but we're a different kind of Baptists. Amen. We actually believe the Bible and try to live it and rightly divide it, man. But in the Roman Catholic, if you, if you really did that as a Roman Catholic, what would you be guilty of if that's really the body and blood of Jesus Christ? Cannibalism. Uh, who thinks about that, though? But that's not where we're going this morning. That, we would be safe because we can preach on stuff we don't really like and that we don't have a problem with, and that would be the, the Catholic belief system. But let, let, let's talk about some stuff we do have a, a problem with. Now, you guys know I do not preach on alliterative things in your Bible. When I say alliteration, that means preachers will pick, you know, everything that begins in S or, or, you know, P or M or, you know, the easy letters. They don't pick one with Z or, you know, Q usually. And I, I'm not trying to be, if it's in the Bible, you know, in distress, in debt, discontented, that, that's a good thing in 1 Samuel 22, but you can live and die by being alliterative in your preaching. But this morning I want to preach on, out of Proverbs, the sluggard, the slothful, the slacker, and the sleeper. You guys need to pay attention to that one this morning, man. <laughs> you say, what are you, what are you saying? Th those things run all throughout the book of Proverbs. We kind of hit what I, I feel the Lord wanted me to hit on those first several weeks in the book of Proverbs, but now we'll, Lord willing, we'll pick some stuff through the book of Proverbs as it goes throughout the week and how God deals with me about some stuff. But these four things just keep hitting me in the face personally and all throughout the book of Proverbs. So let's do this. Let's read John, because this is the root of these things, the sluggard, the slothful, the slacker, and the sleeper. Look at this with me in verse number 56 of John 6. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, I like that, man. My God is alive. He is not dead. Has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Well, it sounds pretty good, right? This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? What a great term. You've got a whole religion built on this hard saying. But look how the Lord, as only he can define it, says to you what those previous verses meant about his flesh and his blood. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at, he said unto them, Did this offend you? What if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth 
Nothing. You heard a message this morning on the heart. Folks, your heart and your flesh by itself without being regenerated, born again, is absolutely useless. The words that I speak in you, they are spirit and they are life. Thank you again, Father, for the morning. Please, please, Father, help me through the power of the Spirit of God to preach and to teach as you would have it for this morning. I have no idea what the need is of the hour, of the moment. These folks that came in here, Father, I, I have no idea what's going on in their lives. I really don't. I say that very often, Father, because I don't want to rely on some philosophical stance I have or some religious stance because I, I don't have one, and I don't want to have one. I want the Spirit of God to take the sword of the Spirit and speak to these folks as only He can. Father, please uh, deal with us in the ear of man today. Father, if there's salvation is needed, please deal with those folks about salvation. If it's strengthening of a saint, may you do that as well. Thank you, Father, for the words of life we have in our possession, the eternal words of life. Father, thank you for our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you for our great redemption, our great Redeemer. And Father, please now, may you be honored and glorified with what's said and done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, go over to Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to start out with a sluggard. <laughs> I mean, just the very name, man. Sluggard. Doesn't it just evoke some emotion in you, our picture? I mean, a sluggard is just a drone, man. He's just, a, he's just kind of a heavy, you know, just lazy kind of person, you know? I, is, I mean, we have an insect, do we not, or whatever they're called, they're called cephalopod, whatever, whatever the crazy name is. Don't we have something called a slug? You ever seen what a slug does? How about not much of anything? He just slugs around, chilling out, man. They're cool to light on fire. They're just phenomenal, man. It's actually part of the snail family. It's a weird little bug, animal, whatever you want to call it. But think about the slug's life. Think about the slug's perspective when we look at what the Bible says about being a sluggard. And compare that to where you're at in your walk with Jesus Christ. Don't look around at anybody else in here. Don't look at me. Don't look at any other brother and sister in Christ about their walk with the Lord or your perception of their walk with the Lord. You look at you this morning and say, Father, am I a slug? Am I a sloth for you? Am, am, am I slack in my relationship with you? Am I slack in the ministry you've given to me? Or am I just asleep? It's all through the book of Proverbs, man. But you know what the one thing about a sluggard is or a slug? They, they have the ability to deteriorate plants. In other words, they're destructive. You wouldn't think that from a, a little stinking, you know, leaves a little mucus trail and kind of, you know, kind of not much anything. Be like, what's the big deal? Yeah, you leave it what they, you look at what they leave behind, man. That enzyme, it destroys whatever it sits around. But the thing I found interesting about a slug is, or a sluggard, it's a hindrance to things that need to get done. So a sluggard's not just chilling on the plant and just hanging out on the sidewalk or whatever. No, it's actually working contrary to what needs to be done. It's a destructive force, but it's also, and this is the one for me personally, it becomes a hindrance to those around it. You see, folks, you've heard me say many times before, but more importantly, you heard the Word of God say it to you. Your life, your sin, your testimony, whatever you do, doesn't just affect you. It affects people around you. Oh, they don't have any idea. Oh, no, 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 no. Everything we do for the cause of Christ to save people has a ripple effect down the road, whether you like it or not. And guess what? They have a right to look at us. People that live over there in the apartments have a right to look at us in the way we conduct ourselves. We should have a good testimony. People that see us out in the streets, we have a bumper sticker in your car, they ought to know that you have a good testimony for Jesus Christ. Okay, well, maybe you don't have to have a testimony for Jesus Christ. Maybe you just do what you want to do, and you can meet your Savior one day. But you say, well, what's that got to do with being a sluggard? A sluggard is a hindrance, man. Your sluggardness, you being a slug for Christ, affects other people. Because you know what happens when you're a slug? You always got to pull them back along. Come on, come on, come on. You, you always got the one kid in the back of the, the group that has to just, you know, <laughs> oh, where we go? Uh -uh. And you got to go, come on, man. And you got to pull their arm out of their socket and pull them back up to you, man. And get them. You know, it's just that sluggard mentality, man. I don't want to be a hindrance to the cause of Christ. I don't want to be a hindrance to you and your walk with Jesus Christ. And guess what? You don't want to be a hindrance to me. 
Folks, we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, there it is again. That's all he talks about. That's all I'm going to keep talking about is God gives me breath. Is our day we stand before our Savior. And I don't want whatever I do to hinder you and your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't want you to hinder me. We're supposed to work together as part of the body of Christ, not working against each other. Well, look what the Bible says. And I know, I know you know this, this passage because we've been here before. But it, it bears repeating. You know, the ones you don't like, you know where they're at, so you mark them and you don't read them the next time you go through your Bible? I mean, I, I, I don't do that. You guys do. I'm just saying. But Verse 6 says this of Proverbs 6. I'd like to say this right off the bat about the sluggard. Now, now, now I want you to think about this for a minute. Can you, can you perceive of any animal that's lower than an ant? I mean, come on, an ant. I mean, not the, not the big jobby ones when you step on, they snap, you know, the really cool ones. You know, the ones who go, ah, when you kill them and you can hear them scream, man. And they got that big belly full of juice, man. Yeah. I'm talking about the little guys that, you know, you know, are just running around like a madman. And you put a firecracker in their hill and they just lose their minds. They put the battle helmets on and come after you. Well, think about how small an ant is. But I want you to think about this as we go through this. A sluggard is worse than an ant. Verse 6 says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep? Oh, sluggard, there's sleep. We didn't, no, don't worry, we're going to hit it. We didn't just cover that point. We're, that's just a little, that's a little preview, man. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travels, and I want as an armed man. I mean, honestly, can you think of anything more weak in its existence than an ant? Can you think of anything more base in its, its life than an ant? And yet the wisest man in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ said, you know what, if you're a sluggard, you ought to go watch the way an ant works and learn something from that ant. Now, I know this is spiritual, and it's supposed to be a spiritual message. It's supposed to deal with your heart and your life as a child of God, but you ought not to be a sluggard in your job. They ought not to look at you and say, oh, he's a Christian, but boy, is he a slug when it comes to getting his stuff done. That testimony doesn't match. You ought to have a good worth ethic where you're at. It's going to go with slothful in a minute. You, part of having a good testimony is you do things right, you do them on time, to the best of your ability, and you get them done. When you don't, you become a sluggard. A I mean, come on, man, a little bitty ant. You're going to tell me, Lord, to go watch an ant and learn from an ant? Yeah, if you're a sluggard. You see, being a sluggard in God's animal kingdom, phylum species ranking, a slug's pretty much at the bottom of it all. In fact, you know where you find a lot of slugs? At the bottom of a nice, moist barrel. You, can, you know what I'm talking about. Just a bottom scrape. They're just bottom. They're not, they're not ever going to get out of that position. A slug's going to be where a slug is, and that's what a slug does. You're no better than the ant. In fact, the ant's much better than you are. How's your walk with the Lord this morning? You a little bit slug. Are you so ambitious to go make money, but you're not ambitious towards your Savior? Are you sluggish in your walk with Jesus Christ, but you're not sluggish when it comes to being a man pleaser? You slug. I, honestly, I dread hearing Jesus Christ say it to me. Thou sluggard. You had all that Bible and all that time, all that salvation. And that's what you've got to show for it? Oh, he's not like that. You're honestly, in a kind Christian way, you're stupid and biblically ignorant if you don't believe that. You need to know something about your Savior. He's not a babe in a manger. He's not a suffering Savior. He's a king that knows everything you've ever done and why you did it. And just hearing him say, you sluggard. How, how dare you waste my salvation? Oh, it's just all going to be love and peace and chicken grease up there. No, it's not. You're going to have to stand in front of that Savior in those eyes of flame and fire. You're going to have to tell him. Give an account. For thou mayest no longer be steward. You know why you're no longer a steward? Because you spent your time being a sluggard. Now, don't go in your heart and your mind thinking about how many tracts you handed out today. Or yesterday. Uh, Brother Frank, you only gave out a couple yesterday, so we told you the Jehovah's Witnesses got you beat, man. I was messing with Frank yesterday. I was like, oh, not a lot of tracks getting out today. I have to mark that down for the Kingdom Hall, man, a little bit later. That's, that's not it, man. 
You see what the media thing you do is you think a slugger, well, I'll just go work more. No, man. It's worship, walk, and then work. I would say don't be a sluggard in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, you're not a sluggard in anything else if you're saved than typically your walk with Jesus Christ. He usually, now you don't have, I don't want any, I don't, but you typically put him second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh down there. He can wait till I get other things done. You know how I know you do that? Because I do it. That's, that's, that's the trait of a sluggard. A hindrance. Wild, man. Don't worry, it's going to get better. Amen. Chapter number 10. Chapter number 10. I have no, I, you already know, man, there is no, I have no shine to me at all, man, when it comes to stuff. It, it hits me way, way harder than it hits you, trust me. Chapter 10 of Proverbs says this in verse 26. 1026, you're wondering about the effect a sluggard has on other people. What a wild verse, man. If you want to go home, have a glass of vinegar. I'm really thirsty. Let me have some vinegar. You know what they gave to Jesus Christ on the cross? Vinegar on a piece of hyssop, did they not? Look what the Bible says in verse number 26. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Imagine sending somebody who is a sluggard at heart, and you have sent them to do a mission for you, to deliver a message, or to, uh, to deliver goods, or to set a strategy for a battle plan, and you send a sluggard. You know what the effect of that sluggard has on you that sent them? I, okay, let's get real about it. When you cook on the grill, and you let that thing get seven, 800 degrees, which Karen absolutely despises, but I love it. I like, get that thing, I mean, white hot, man. Just white hot. But you know what comes with that if you didn't clean the grill beforehand? What happens when you lift that lid up, guys, and you get that face, Ow! <laughs> You're like, oh, that hurt. And then you say some ungodly words, and you're like, you say, well, I know we're laughing, but that's the effect a sluggard has on somebody who sends them, and that sluggard doesn't perform the duty they were sent to do. Lifting up that grill and getting that just hot smoke and it hits you in the face and you're like, oh, oh, and then you start watering and you're, you're useless. You're useless for 30 seconds to a minute, man. And it stings bad. Vinegar to the teeth. What a, what a picture vinegar is. Go home, like I said, go, go get yourself a nice, uh, a nice cold glass of vinegar. No, make it, make it lukewarm. That'd be even better. Throw that on your teeth, man. Especially if you've got some sores going or some canker. See how that feels for you. That's the effect a sluggard has when they don't do what they've been sent to do. Have you and I not been sent to do something? Have you not been given the ministry of reconciliation? Have not you and I been given the gospel, the grace of God? Have you and I not been given a full Bible and full salvation and eternal life and the comfort of the Holy Ghost and everything else? Have we not been given so much? And then the Lord says, well, why aren't you doing it? Imagine Jesus Christ getting smoke in His eyes that causes him grief and pain that he can't even look anymore at your life because you're such a sluggard. Oh. Why is he such a sluggard? You know where that comes from? An unthankful heart, man. And just, 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 just that, 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 that lazy, I, I just, you, know, I, you know what? I want God to do what I want him to do for me, but I'm not doing anything for him. We don't say that, but we act like it. So you are the profound definition of a taker, not a giver. Look what the Bible goes on to say with me. Chapter 13 of Proverbs. Chapter 13, verse number 4. Chapter 13, verse 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Go to chapter number 20 of Proverbs. Chapter number 20. Look at verse number four. Probably a Bible coincidence that they're both in verse number four. Look at verse number four of chapter 20. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Imagine that. I'd like to have the walk that Charles Spurgeon had with Jesus Christ. I'd like to know the Bible as well as some of the great saints that have ever lived. I'd like to be a soul winner like Billy Graham. 
Do you honestly think people get that by just some magical touch from God? Yes, they are gifted. But you don't think it's any labor or any time or effort? You just heard Brother Kenny this morning when he went through the, started going through the heart. That takes time. And he was pressured yesterday when I looked at him and I said, you don't have your Sunday school done yet. And he's like, <laughs> but it takes time. Bible Christianity, Bible walk with the Lord, that doesn't just happen. I'm telling you right now, that's what turns most saved people off. I want it all. I want, I cannot, the first time I heard Dr. Rucker preach, I'm like, there's no way anybody knows anything like that. But I didn't sit back and go, he knows everything, I know nothing. No, I'm like, that ticks me off that he knows that. And the best part is he said, you can know it like I know it. He put me on the same level and said, I'm nothing special. I got the same amount of Holy Ghost as you got. But you know what's different? Diligence. Heart to study. Work at it. Oh, I don't read well. I'm so wore out with that. You read well when you want to read well, man. And there's ways around that. Brother Jonathan gave him some MP3s. Alexander Scory, good place to start. Start listening to it. You know what would be a good idea as he's reading Scorby? Maybe open it along, read along with him. I don't know. I'm just not a smart guy. Maybe that would be a smart thing to do. You say you're mean. Oh, I'm 100% mean. You know why I'm mean? Because I'm a sluggard. And it ticks me off I'm a sluggard. And you don't have to be. And then you go stand in front of the judgment seat and go, huh? I was expecting more gold, silver, and precious stones, Lord. I was expecting at least 10 cities. <laughs> what accountant firm do you work for? Do we cheat him and how? Yeah. You've been a sluggard for the bulk of your life, and you're not going to get what the Apostle Paul gets or Timothy got. Or you're, it, you could have, but you chose to take the sluggard route. I, look, he won't, he, you know what? It's too cold out. I'm not going to plow today. It's snowing out. I'm not going to do that. Okay, then, you know what? Beg in time of harvest and have nothing. That's mean. No, that's the Word of God, man. 26. Proverbs 26, please. You know what the worst part about a sluggard? He doesn't think anything's wrong with him. <laughs> 26, 16. I know the slothfuls of verse 15. What a, what a, there, we'll get to that in a minute. 26, 16 says this. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. <laughs> I'm a sluggard. Don't really care. and Everything's good with me being a sluggard. Oh, and I'm smarter in you in my sluggardness than you are in your wisdom. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit. Well, I'm, I'm not a sluggard. Why well, have you compared yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ or the Word of God? Have you put yourself under the microscope of the, of the Word of God to see if your take on it is the same as God's take? No, I just go by what other people say. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the hearts and, the, and try the reins. You will fool yourself and other people will tell you what you want to hear. They'll smooze you, man. Oh, the sluggard. I like that, man. And I'm, con I'm actually conceited about me being a sluggard. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm not a hindrance to anybody, am I? I don't know. Ask the Lord, man. But you won't. You won't ask Him because you know what the answer already is. The Spirit of God's already told you you've got a sluggard heart and a sluggard attitude. But your own conceit's keeping that in you and you won't deal with it. You know, what? You know who can help that? Nobody but Jesus Christ. I love what Dennis, Brother Dennis Knowles says down in Tennessee. The only one I can fix is myself. I can't fix you unless I fix myself first, unless I'm willing to be fixed and willing to let him do surgery on me and willing me to repent and turn from what I am and let him, I can, there's no way I can cure you. And there's, I can't get you from being a sluggard until you go to your Savior and say, I'm a sluggard. Would you please help me not be a hindrance to anybody by my hindrance in my walk with you? Would you, take, would you, would you just make that right, Lord? You know what? He will. We get this weird concept that God's some ogre up there who just throws lightning bolts and floods and kills babies and doesn't care, and yet nobody knows the God of the Bible that He is holy and just and true and loving and kind. And if you turn to Him with the right heart and the contrite spirit, He'll hear you, and you won't believe the miracle He can do in you. He'll change you, man. And He'll keep on working on you if you let Him. But if you're sluggard about it, He's like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, sluggards, man. They're just wise and no one can see. God resisteth the proud, 
that conceitedness. I'm not a sluggard, and I don't see anything wrong with me and the way I'm walking. Oh, okay, okay, well, have a good time with yourself. Nobody can do anything for you until you wake up like the prodigal son and say, what am I doing in this hog pen? I will arise and go to my father. Go on with me to Proverbs 21, please. Proverbs 21, let's look at the slothful. It's been such a good morning already. Let's pick the next one. Now, you, you, you folks know what a... I mean, you can't pick better word pictures than Almighty God. You ever seen a sloth? Even the cartoon ones? I'm trying to remember some of the satanic Disney stuff we watched. Haley, you probably guys can probably... What's the, the sloth, man? They're just kind of... Oh, I haven't seen that because I'm saved, so I don't know that one, but... But I mean, you know, the, the three toed sloth, they're just. You know, and they got the droopy face, and they're kind of like. They haven't done their hair in a month of Sundays, man. No shower. Don't change their drawers. Just dirt, just dirty, laid, you know. But you get the picture is that animal. They're not moving for anything. They're just in that. You say, what's the difference between. Well, this one is just. He's just idle. He's idle. Won't eat unless the food is right there in front of them, man. Won't move unless it's right there in front of them. Just a, just a, just a slothful, lazy, idle, no movement. Now, listen, I like chilling like the next person does. But don't after a while, don't you just got to get up and move? I hate sitting at work, man. It messes my back up, messes my hip up. But just in general, I have to get up and walk around. Even in an office where there's like four people and like a 50,000 square foot, I got to get up, walk downstairs, see the guys. I got to go around. You know, you got to go see the, the union, the union scum down in the bottom. You know what I'm saying? No. You got to go, you got to go see, you got to go, you got to go with the common clave and go talk to the, you know, the, 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 the rats on the, the union rats on the floor and all that. But I mean, no, I actually, I got to get up and move. You know what? Because what happens is you get slothful. It becomes a spirit in you. It's, it's just that, it's that idleness. I would say this with 100% with biblical accuracy. There is no idleness in a, in a Bible believer's life. You're either going forward or you're regressing backwards. I know there's idleness all throughout the Word of God, but that, that slothful spirit actually leads to you in regression in your walk with Jesus Christ. Look what the Bible says to me in 21, 20, 21 25. The, Now, it sounds very similar to the sluggard. I, I understand that. 21, 25 says, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. <laughs> he wants to do <laughs> The desire he has to actually perform it, is actually killing him. It's eating away at him. Because you know why? He doesn't have the gumption, the activity, and the drive to actually do what his desire is driving at him. The Bible just said the, sl the desire of the slothful kills him. Now, how many, now, 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 let's just be brutally honest about it. How many of you would like to win lotto for $300 million, man? Yeah. Thank you, James. The one saved person in the whole room, man. How many of you like to be just rich in general, man? Do you know most people that are rich didn't just get it given to them? They actually worked at it. And anybody who has had a rich father or rich family, they forced that kid that was going to be an inheritor of that wealth to start at the bottom and maybe go get a real job for many, many years and to suffer and pay their own bills before they got what was coming to them or what they thought was coming to them. In other words, the desire can kill you if you're not willing to put it into practice. I'd like to be a good athlete. Have you run in the last 20 years? I'd like to be in shape. Have you picked up a weight other than a donut in the last 10 years? We make fun of Polly, and we should. But I mean, I mean if you want to be 5'7 and 160 pounds and buffed out, you go lift weights, right, Polly? Or is that 5'7 five, 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 and, and a half? Thank you, there. I knew he had to get that, you know. You got to you be precise now with Polly, or you'll freak out on you. That's it. In one, in one, see? 
But if you'd like to be strong and have some musculature to you, that doesn't just happen, man. You have to actually go to a gym or invest in some weights and actually start picking them up. Not staring at them and going, I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, you're Arnold Levenstein, 110 pounds. In other words, you have the desire to do it, but you won't go do it. It's that idle. It's, it's just slothful, man. Imagine the sloth getting up every day, chilling up in the tree, just hanging up there, one arm, just cooling out, man. You want something to eat today? Sure. Well, have some food on the ground. Yeah, but we'd have to drop down and walk over and get up. You understand what I'm saying? It's a silly illustration, but that's what a sloth is. I'd like to be something. I have a desire to do something. But let me tell you, without you getting out of your idle nature, it ain't going to happen. I will not ask for a show of hands again, but how many of you in here have actually read the Bible through every word at least once? Maybe twice. But you want to know the Bible like somebody who's been at it for 35, 40 years. Do you think the guy that knows the Bible has been doing it for 35, 40 years has just been sitting around, not reading it, not studying it, not witnessing, not praying, not fasting, not putting it into practice? you think that just happened? No. See, the desire is, I, I, would, I want that. Well, okay. Well, guess what? You have to start one day saying, I'm going to put some shoe leather to that desire. There is the gift that God does give people to be an artist, to be whatever. But if you never pick up a paintbrush, how do you know what that gift is? You think Rembrandt would just Rembrandt? Just happen? You know how many times he probably screwed up before he became Rembrandt? But the desire translated into action. He wasn't a sloth. I mean, just, I mean when you say these words, doesn't it just freak you out? Sloth. They just sound like lazy and idle. Go, go to 1227. Uh, we can't, I don't want to belabor this, but I, I want to show you uh, some things about this slothful person. He, he has the desire, but he will not put any action to accomplish that desire. Look what the Bible says to me over in uh, 12. Chapter, Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12, please. Look at verse number 27. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. Go over to 19, please. Proverbs 19. Look at Proverbs 19. Look at number 24. 1924 says, A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth. Again, look at 2615 while you're right here. 2615. This goes with what we just read. Look at verse number 15. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Give me two more on this. Go to 22. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Look at verse 13. Proverbs 22, 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Look at 26.13. Back where we were. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. <laughs> oh, man. You're so idle. You're so out of it. You won't even take your hand out of your bosom to bring it to your mouth again. You killed a 10-pointer, 160 pounds dressed out, man. But you won't cook it because you're too slothful. That's what you read. A man takes a, take, in honey, he won't even roast what he took. You're telling me you put, through, you put the time and effort in to go hunting and get dressed up and put the camo on and the, and the, and the, and the dough and estrus urine all over you so they don't smell. You know the whole deal, man. And wait, Jonathan, that's, that's, oh, that's your Kelowna choice, man. I mean, seriously, man. <laughs> Jen's like, oh, that's what you always smell. I like that, man. <laughs> but you, you, the dough and estrus, that's what you do, man. Or you go out with the turkey and then, rrr, 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 and come on, man. You guys have turkey? It's phenomenal, man. 
you do all that, all, you're willing to not be slothful in that, then you kill it, then you're like, ah, it'll cook itself. <laughs> oh, what is wrong with you, man? You put your hand in your bosom, but, oh, you know, oh, oh man, I, oh, it's, it's too far of a journey from my pocket up to my mouth. The desire is there. You're desirous about some things, but to see it actually through, you will not do it. That's being slothful, man. Uh, does he not say over in Romans chapter number 12 to not be slothful in business? Pauline epistle. What does he say to the man in Matthew 25? And I know it's a kingdom age doctrine. I fully know where I'm at. What's he say to the guy that takes the one talent and buries it? You wicked and slothful servant. Didn't you know? Well, I knew you were an austere man. I, 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 knew, I knew what you were like. You knew what I was like, and yet you took what I gave you and buried it in the ground? You knew what I was like, and you still went and did it. You wicked, slothful servant. I can hear that one coming from the judgment seat of Christ, too. You took what I gave you, and you buried it in the ground? You knew what I was like. You've read that Bible through over and over again. You ran your mouth like you knew what you're talking about. You knew what I was like, and you took my talent, and you buried it? You wicked, slothful servant, you. That's Jesus Christ saying it. The slothful man. Desire, oh, I'm, I'm glad I got the talent. Oh, okay, what are you going to do with it? Go bury it in the ground? You're going to be slothful in your business? In any kind of business you're involved in? Nope. Shouldn't be. It's a big thing to the Lord not to be slothful, man. It's a big thing. I really don't like doing this and going through this, man. Believe me. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. You say that a lot. Yeah, because I'm a, kind of a... Kind, kind of not a real, a real good child of God, man. Working on it. Let's look at the slacker. Proverbs 10. Now, have you ever heard somebody say to you, cut me some slack? That's what you guys are saying to me right now. <laughs> In Bible terminology, and we're going to look at it, when, when slack is there, it's a lack of tension. Now, slack in some cases is good. You need to give people some slack with some rope, and you need to give people some grace. I have no, no problem with that uh, analogy and application at all. But where we're going this morning is, you know what a slacker is? He just doesn't think it's important. It's not that, I'm not being driven by it. It's, it's slack in thought and slack in speech and, you know, slack in dress. I don't know, I grew up in the era where you tucked your shirt in. I didn't know this, but some clown has invented the untuckable shirt. Now... I'm not going to get on you if you don't have your shirt tucked in, but I now get what my mom meant. It typically looks really just like your slack. I think the term is slob is the one mom used. You know, shoes untied, because it was a cool thing, you know, to leave your shoes untied and be a cool guy and all that, until you tripped or caught out your laces on something and went face forward, and then mom laughed at you. You're just, it, it's just a slight, you know what, you know what, I don't have to read my Bible today. You know what, I can get to the prayer list tomorrow. You know what, church will always be there. I, I, I'll go when I can make it. Yeah. Well, that's not me, preacher. See, that's not me saying it, God's saying it to you. You are a slacker in your heart, you're a slacker in your life, you're a slacker in your walk with Jesus Christ. We should have some tension to us. It should be real. You heard it in Sunday school. This is not a joke to me. It's not the way I make a living. You guys don't pay me anything. I'm not saying that to be a smart guy. I don't want you to pay me anything. You're either going to do it because you love Jesus Christ or you're not. But there's some tension to it. It's real. I'm not t walking around just like I'm pins and needles all the time. But it's real, man. People's souls are in the balance. People are going to hell literally every minute or probably every 38 seconds. Or they're going to heaven. Point being is eternity is right around the corner. It's within the next 30 seconds. For somebody somewhere on this planet. 
there should be some tension. You should not slack off on this thing. You should not cut yourself any quarter when it comes to your walk with Jesus Christ. I know you're going to finish this verse for me, but you ought to think about it a little more than just finishing the verse. A little leaven does what? Now, see, we, we say that and we quote it because we want to be cool and all that, but do, we re- do you honestly think a little slack is good for you in your walk with Jesus Christ? Because you know what creeps in? The slack mentality. Doesn't he say over in 2 Peter chapter number 3, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? For the Lord, he's, not, he's not slack as some men count slackness. We count slack. The Lord says, I'm not slack like you. Imagine if Jesus went to the cross whenever he wanted to. Imagine if he just didn't go at all. Ah, who cares? I don't know. What's the big deal, man? I mean, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll get it tomorrow. Now, you, know what? you know what? You know what? Let me put this off for a few hundred years. What's the big deal? He doesn't count slack like you and I count slack. In fact, he looks at it and goes, I cannot believe you have such slack in your life. Now, come on, man, you automotive folks in here, you know what happens when a belt gets slack to it. Break, slip off the pulley, the whole night. You know what slackness can cause. A lot of damage, man. Again, I'm trying to balance this out with not going off the rails and saying just walk around like, a, like you're just, you're, 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 you know, you got 500 milligrams of caffeine in you every hour. But you ought to have some tension to your Christian life that it's the most important thing you got going on. And you ought not to slack in it, neither should I. You know what? We take the Lord for granted way too much. We take each other for granted way too much. We take for granted people are praying for us. I hope they do. I hope people pray for me before I preach during the week. I pray for you guys. What happens if we were slacking that? Just let it go for a few days. Ah, you know what? It'll be there. And then you die. And you never get another chance to hand out a Bible track or read your Bible or pray. Slack, man. Just, sl- just, just laying off. Ah, you know, you know, it's, all, it's, all, it's all good, brother. It ain't all good. I don't know where you got that from, man. It's not all good. All things work together for good. You don't know what that verse means, so shut your mouth when you falsely quote it. It's not all good, man. You should walk around redeeming the time and just don't be slack, man. Just like, oh, it's just all giddy. I just came from the dentist's office. I'm full of helium. I don't get it, man. You know what the opposite of slack is for me? Sober. You know what the difference between being drunk and being sober is, or hope, thank God you don't. But when you're drunk, you have no control, you're underneath the power of another spirit, you're all over the place. When you're sober, you're of your right mind, right wits, and know what's going on. When somebody's slack, it's like, eh, eh. K sera, sera, whatever it will be, will be. That's Doris Day, I believe, right, Kathleen? Yeah, I know. I go to the older folks, they're like, you guys are like, Doris Day? Is that a rapper? But you know that case, oh, whatever will be, will be. Well, I understand that. But why be slack in your mentality about that? Look what the Bible says to me in 10.4. 10.4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. I like that. Go to Deuteronomy 23. Go to Deuteronomy 23, please. Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, pick it up in verse number 21. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. The Bible says this, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. Make a deal with God. And then don't pay it. Or defer to pay it, like Ecclesiastes 5, 4, and 5 says. You'd be better off not to vow that vow than to be slack in paying back the vow you made. You know, you make, you make a deal. Oh, don't stare at me like a tree full of owls. You've, made all, you've all made deals with God, whether you know it or not. 
you know, the secret thing in the heart, and you know, oh, I just get out of this, oh, man, oh, I'll change my, oh, oh, don't let this happen again. Oh, God, whatever you want. Oh, oh yeah, you've made, you've made deals with them. Have you been slack in paying back your vow? Have you had a slack hand in giving back what you said you'd do? Are you slacking your creditor to the creditors you owe money to? Are you slack in holding up the promises? I honestly, I felt terrible on Friday night, man. I, I did. I told the guys and girls that, uh, guys and girls, man, they're older than that, man. Uh, older folks at Woodlake, that would bring them a Bible. And I honestly, I told, I, we were coming near the end of Wednesday night service and we had Allah showed up and a few other people showed up. <laughs> And, and, and I, I knew we were coming to the end of Wednesday night service, and I knew because we talked to him on Tuesday at Woodlake that I, I was going to bring him a Bible, and I knew I had to grab him a Bible. So what did I do on Wednesday night when I left? Didn't grab a Bible. Oh, that's okay. Honestly, it's not okay because I told him I would bring it to him. It's not okay. I, I, told, I laid my word out there. Oh, that's all right, man. No, it's really not all right. Because I laid myself out and said I would do it. So now the next time, though they might be kind and courteous, you know what the next time they're going to think when I say something to them is? Liar. You can tell when somebody's lying to you when they, the first word is honestly. That's part of slackness, man. You're going to say something, but you won't do it. You're going to lay yourself out, but you're not going to perform it. And if you do, it's, ah, you know what? I, they're good. They can handle it. If, I, if I'm a little slack, what about your personal testimony of Jesus Christ, man? I felt horrible about that thing. I want to grab my Bible and I'm going to go up and drop it off to him. It's not good, man. I'm guilty of this stuff like you are. I don't want, I want to be less guilty of it. Uh, you're not going to be sinless down here, but you know what you can do, brother, sister? You can sin less. You're not going to be sinless down here. But you can sin less. You know, eh, no, he's perfect. You're supposed to be perfect. That's not sinlessness. You're supposed to be complete. You already are complete, Christ. But your life is supposed to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that sin is supposed to start getting weeded out of your life, man. But if you're slack, nah. It, you know what? It doesn't matter. You know what? I'll put it off. It doesn't matter. It's, you know what? It's too intense the way he goes at it. Not as intense as it's going to be when Jesus Christ sees me and looks at me. Go with me over to uh, Joshua 18. Uh, yeah, Joshua 18. Joshua 18, please. Joshua 18. If you could. Verse number 1 says this. Joshua 18.1, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? They had it given to them. Why are you not going and taking it? You know why? You're slack. You know what you got in your lap? Oh, here he goes again. Yep, here I go again. You've got the very word and words of Almighty God in your lap, purified seven times, incorruptible, without defilement, 100% the word of God. You've got promises in there. You can't even count on promise to you as a New Testament Christian. You have the joys of prayer, an intercessor that's right up there, a daysman that is at the right hand of the Father. That's all he does is he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. But you're not going to take advantage of that. You know what? Because you're slack. I just, I need to ease off on that. This Christianity stuff's a little too serious, you know. I can only deal with it an hour a week. I don't want it anymore. You know, I, it's just too much, man. Joshua says, a type, Jesus, Jesus, he's a type of Jesus Christ. He says, you have everything given to you. God gave it to you. Why are you, why are you slack and not taking what he gave you? I'm not talking about the Benny Hinn prosperity garbage. I'm talking about the things God gave you as a child of God through the blood of His Son in that King James Bible, and you sit back and you're slack and you won't do anything about it. And the worst part is, you're happy about it. 
I don't get that, man. I don't get that. That you're happy where you just, eh, eh. But again, the only one I can change is me. I'm just letting you know a few little things that come to heart and mind from the Word of God as I read it this past week. Why are you slack? Why, why won't you take and employ what God has given you? Let me ask you a question. How can you know what God's given you if you're not in that book? Do you even know who you are in Christ? Do you know what He's given you in Christ? Do you know where you're going? Can you tell me anything about the city you're going to live in? Can you tell me about the earth you're coming back to in the millennial kingdom? Can you tell me anything about the judgment seat of Christ? Oh, you're qu yeah, I'm on you. This is not just for Dave Brown. The book is for every one of us that are saved. And you ought not just be happy going home to heaven. Thank God you are. But okay, uh, can, can, we, can we move past that now? He's no longer on the cross, folks. He's no longer in the tomb. You know where he is? He never stays static or stagnant. He's going to come in the clouds and get us. He's going to go back to the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to come back to the earth for a thousand years. Then he's, he's, he's always... He, the cross is done. You're saved. Thank God for it. Now let's go. Don't be slack, man. You know what? Give as much time to your Bible as you give to TV the next week. Or to something else in your life you love more than you love your God. I'm saying that to help you, man. It'll improve your walk with Jesus Christ. It'll take some of the slack out of your life. Be good for you, man. Proverbs chapter number 20. Let's look at the sleeper quickly. I want to say this before we get going. <laughs> There's nothing like a good sleep, man. I'm serious. Sleep is good for you. But as with everything in the King James Bible, you have to have a balance about it. Sleep is good, boy. When you're worn out, you're tired, man, or you're sick, I mean, sleep is good, man. It can be sweet sleep, too. You get that air conditioner down like 55, and it's just freezing in there. Oh, yeah, and Riley and Kylie are all snuggled up under the Afghan, man, chilling. They can, they're barely breathing. They're almost dead. You've got to put, put their finger under their nose, get some, you know, make sure they're breathing. Man. Oh, that's the best time to sleep, man. And you KO, man. The problem is most of us sleep too much spiritually. Do you need rest? 100%. Should you take a vacation? Should you take a vacation? 100%. Just don't stay on vacation. You can go away on vacation physically, but you don't have to go away spiritually. What happens in our modern-day Christianity is we're asleep, man. We're just KO'd. We're in that nice, chilly bedroom, blackout blinds like the girls have. My two daughters have the blackout blinds. Man, I don't get that, man. Save people like light, Haley. I'm just saying. There's some, and not night lights either. Those don't count, man. She has, she has, a, she has a black drape around her night lights. I don't know why she's doing <laughs> But I mean, but I mean, but I mean, you know, it's, they're in there, you know, save people are in there and the blinds are just so pitch black and you got the little thing over their eyes, you know, and they're just asleep. That's where you're at in modern day Christianity. And what happens is you have this fake revival nonsense like they had down in North Carolina or wherever it was. And people think, oh, the third great awakening. No, let, let me just tell you from, from, from uh, now please take this the right way. I know you won't, but I'm going to say it anyway. Please take it from a real Christian who's trying to live a Bible Christian life. Christianity is done. I still want to see some people save and train, but I'm talking Christianity, a Christian nation. You're not a Christian nation. Get, get, get away from me with your foolishness. Well, if we get Trump in there, it'll change. You are an idiot. I hope he gives us Hillary Clinton. I do. I hope he gives us the worst possible candidate possible. Just so safe people can get back to the Bible and trust in God and not the Republicans and not the white people and not the money and everything. And safe people can actually trust Jesus Christ for once. Weird stuff. But this, your nation's in trouble, man. Your saved people are in trouble. Asleep at the wheel. Oh, everything's... It's so great. But if you've got the joy of the Lord, that's different. But look around you, man. This world was wicked 2,000 years ago. It's not getting better until Jesus Christ comes back. Just in the meantime, I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do, have a joyful smile about it, and not be asleep at the wheel when he comes back. Uh, we're not, we, we don't have time to turn there, but I'll just bring some things to your, your heart and your memory, hopefully. 
Do you remember when the boys are up on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke 9? I know where I'm at in Proverbs. We'll get there in a minute. I'm not totally demented, but I'm getting there. Remember the boys are up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they get to see Him as God with no wounds? That's still the coolest thing to me. He doesn't have the wounds yet. He hasn't gone to the cross. And they get to see God manifest in the flesh, full-blown, no wounds, no spit in His beard, no anything. And the Bible says they were, they were asleep. The other, con Matthew and Mark don't tell you. Luke says they were asleep. You're asleep in the presence of God? I think you got the point right there. You can be asleep even in the presence of God. Do you remember over in uh, Luke 22 when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane? He goes away three times to pray. He, he prays, goes. And the last time, he says, he, he catches him, he goes, what are you doing? Couldn't you watch one hour? They were asleep as their Savior's going to the cross, being to, going to be falsely condemned and convicted in the kangaroo court and they're asleep you know what i get from the passage over mark 14 the same account of that you know the last time jesus comes back and says you're asleep and all that? you know what he says to those boys sleep on now and take your rest you know what you're going to be asleep you know what go fall asleep now i wish to god you wouldn't but see that's the side of god people don't like you want to have have at it he says over in Revelation 22, you want to be filthy? Just keep being filthy. You want to be holy? Be holy. You want to be a, a, a froward? Be froward. I, you know what? You do you. I'm just trying to exhort you today. Don't, if you are asleep, you're a sleeper, don't stay asleep. Wake up, man. I'm talking spiritually wake up. You're not going to have national revival, but saved people can have some revival in their life with their Savior. Oh, yeah, man. How can you fall asleep when God is right in front of you? Oh, done it more than once. We make a joke about it, but it's really not a joke. If you have insomnia, get your prayer list out. Why do you, you could, you could not have slept for days, and you still can't fall asleep because you're so frazzled. But you're saved, and you take out the prayer list. You'll be asleep within 10 minutes. Why do you think that is? Right where we started in John, the flesh profiteth nothing. You know how all these things are going to affect you? Because you're still trusting in your flesh. And your flesh is slothful, and your flesh is a sluggard, and your flesh likes to sleep, and your flesh likes to be slack. And until you realize your flesh cannot profit you, my friend, you're going to fit one of these four to the day you go home to glory. And would to God you wouldn't. Let's read, let's read a couple of verses, then we'll, we'll shut it down. Look at the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 13. Proverbs 20, verse 13 says, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Go over me to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, verse 30 says this, I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Nothing wrong with sleep. You just cannot love it, man. I don't, I don't get it, man. Save people just to sleep. Couldn't care less, man. No reaction, no conviction, no nothing. Just going through life. That's, you, know, you know why these churches that do all the, you know, the rah, 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 sis, boom, bah, we're cool, you're not. You know, put the signs up, T-E-A-M, team, you know, do all the cheerleading and all that stuff. And the guy gets up and raps to you for 20 minutes of some nonsensical, foolish, psycho babble garbage out of a corrupt, filthy Bible that came out of the pit of hell. Yeah. 
That just summed up America Christianity, just for in case you're wondering. You can go back on the tape and rewind that. It was Holy Ghost given, trust me. You know why? Because it gives them a little bit of a wake up and a little bit of, you know, is it, it, you know all they do is open the Bible at that church. All they do is sing songs. And the air conditioning's on. That's cold and I don't like it. I'm just saying, man. You go to that because you like the, it's got liveliness and, oh, it's like Van Halen, but with Jesus. And you know what? You wake out, you go out of that more asleep than when you went in. Because there's no sword of the Spirit. There's no thus saith the Lord. There's no God's Holy Ghost dealing with you about your life. And you went out the same way you came in. And no change, and honestly, no desire to change because they made you feel good about it. My job is not to make you feel horrible. It's his job. Yep. Last one, and we're going to pray. Go to Isaiah 56. This is totally off script, and that's okay. That's okay. Might be really on script, to be honest with you. Look at the Bible says, I didn't even go to Romans 13 and all the other ones about sleep, and we don't, you've heard them several times. Look what the Bible says in 56 of Isaiah, verse number 9. All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves a strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. That's the modern day preacher, the modern day church. Oh, I'll give you some wine and make you feel good. Everything's wonderful and great, and oh, you know what, if you just die and go to hell, ah, no big deal. Ah, tomorrow will be just like today, you idiot. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For your life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. For this you ought to say, the Lord will. You have no idea what's waiting for you outside those doors. But the shepherds and the dogs, they can't talk because they're sleeping and they're full of themselves. Oh, well, we'll offer you something. Oh, come on in. You, no, we, we, we love you. We do love you. You've got the wrong perception of love. You think love is this weird, warm, ooky, crazy, shine Jesus, shine garbage. And it's not. Those guys, you just read what those guys do in the pulpit. You just read what those shepherds do. You just read what those dogs can't even speak. They have no voice. But they say, ah, oh, just come, come this way. Well, you know what? It'll be like it tomorrow. Don't, hey, you know what? When you leave here today, don't think about anything that was preached. Just go your way. Don't worry about your heart from Sunday school. Your heart's great. And don't, don't worry about being a sluggard or a slothful or a slacker or a sleeper or all the other S's he used. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's not just him. He's, just, he's, an, he's been an idiot for 30 years. Don't worry about it. It's just him anyway. It's just the way he is. We pray for his wife a lot. <laughs> or you could actually go out here and say, you know what? Lord, you got me. And I'm glad you got me. And I need some help. And would you change me, please? And the inner man. Because I don't, I don't want to meet my Savior in any one of these. I don't want, I don't want to be a hindrance to being a slug. I don't want to be, a, I don't want to be idle as a, sl uh, as a sloth. I don't want to be a slacker and, and not, be, not think this is real and that attention needs to be given to the eternal. And I don't want to be asleep, man. Especially if he comes in the clouds and... And it happened just like that. What, do you think you're going to have a time delay? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Gone. Father, thank you for the morning. Thank you for how great you've been and wonderful to us. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Thank you for the Word of God. Please, Father, would you deal with these folks and deal with me as only you can, that we would examine ourselves in light of the Word of God and the words of God and not in the light of how another person may be walking or what another person thinks about me. But Father, help us to be Holy Ghost introspective, how you view us and your view of us in our walk with you. Father, please help us to love you. 
with a right heart, a fervent heart, a merry heart, as we heard today, and an unfeigned heart. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, Father, for being so kind. We ask your blessing now as we go in Christ's name. Amen. See you tonight at 5 o'clock, Lord willing.